I imagine uh, many of you are disappointed just as I look for who is going to be the speaker, which was the representative Tom Burton. That's great. That's tonight. That's still on. So, who am I filling? Who am I filling in for? sitting on a bench over in the Wrinkle Ranch, which is our place where we retired people live, and it's choice. And uh, I was minding my own business, and he walked through and saw me sitting there and said he can't find somebody for a program, <laughs> and could I get up and say something? Well, I said, well, my experiences with uh, World War II and the Korean War and and the reserves and what have you. I've got about 27 medals, but all of them are for visiting places, and uh, none of them for bra bravery that I can recall. And uh, as far as anybody shooting at me, I never saw it. It was just torpedoes going by it, back and forth. But um, I had a bunch of things happening that uh, I thought was funny, and through the years I thought sometime I'd like to pass them on. And so on short notice, uh, and then it was compounded by after I agreed to come over here, my uh, daughter called up and said she was on the way back to Africa and is on the way to the airport, and her husband's a missionary, <laughs> and so that compounded thing. And so I said, well, you make your own peanut butter and jelly sandwich visit with old dad before we leave. Now, um, just to give you a brief idea of my military experience, which is very limited, but I uh, I like to always to get dressed up and have things hanging on you and what have you in the Boy Scouts. And so uh, I was fortunate enough, we I joined a troop with, we were kind of slow thinkers because we didn't discover girls when we were Boy Scouts, so as a result, we stayed in there. And we had a patrol of Eagle Scouts, which was nine Eagle Scouts. In most cases, those of you who are in Scouts, there's so many things starts happening and pulling you away in. But in any case, all those fellows went on and were involved in uh, World War II, and, and many of them uh, were in leadership deals, I think corporals and sergeants and a few lieutenants and what have you. But in any case, just to give you an idea where all these stories are coming from, uh, I don't recall ever being in real danger, and I'll cover that short story, but uh, it was a matter of a lot of things I thought were kind of humorous. Uh, when the National Guard got called up out in the Midwest uh, state of Illinois, they must have known something was in the mill because this was a couple of months before uh, Pearl Harbor. And so after they left, then the state of Illinois formed a state militia. And uh, I was the youngest person in there mainly because I lied about my age and talked my mother into signing the form. And, uh, but the commanding officer of the state militia there was a major, but he was also the father of the girl that I played touch football with down in his yard, so he knew how old I was. But in any, in any case, I, uh, on the night of Pearl Harbor, I had the distinction of being in full charge of the parking lot outside the armory. That was mainly keep people who wanted to go to the movie nearby didn't park over where everybody who was supposed to be reporting back to the armory because we didn't know what to expect out of uh, the way Pearl Harbor. 
Anybody can recall where they were on Sunday night on Pearl Harbor? Good memory. Some of you are too young to know that, right? But uh, in any case, so they gave me a 500-pound rifle. I can remember walking around with that thing without any shells in it and telling people they couldn't park there. And, uh, so I was impressed with what I was trying to do. And then uh, after we had training in bayonet drill, I decided that wasn't a real me. I would rather be a naval officer. And uh, so I did that the hard way. I went off to college in 42, when I was just out of high school. And um, I was going to be a Boy Scout executive, that's a grown up businessman who needs a business administration degree and, and works organizing the local scouts in the area. And uh, so as a result of that, I had experience of laying out in the mud when I was a Boy Scout. So I was firmly convinced that I didn't want to go in the Army type thing. And so I started off as what they call a cadet midshipman. There's four military academies that the government runs. That's West Point and Annapolis and the, and the Air Force Academy. And um, it's a matter of, I went to a new one that they started up, and that was King's Point. It was the Merchant Marine Academy. And the greatest number of losses that any of the services and was the Merchant Marine mainly because they didn't have any shore equivalent comparison. And so they were very hard up for Merchant Marine officers, either as decks, people up on steering the ship and down in the engine room type thing. And so you start off with a title of cadet midshipman. And uh, all that was was an officer in training and I stuck through it and through the years and being uh, involved in World War II and the Korean War and then in the reserves. I finally retired as a uh, commander in the Naval Reserve. Uh, both my sons outranked me. <laughs> they, uh, I talked them into the Coast Guard. And back at the time when they were in high school, uh, Going in the military wasn't looked at uh, favorably between a lot of people, what have you. And I can remember my two sons saying, Dad, we don't want to kill people, we just want to save them. So that's when I mentioned the Coast Guard. And uh, as I say, they outranked me. The uh, younger boys had commands of four ships so far, and he just kicked, finished up in Kodiak, Alaska finishing having command of the largest ship they have in the Coast Guard with the exception of the one new one that they're trying to get to run right. <laughs> if you've been following anything of that in the news, it's uh, kind of embarrassing the number of things that don't work after somebody signed off on it. But, uh, and Big Brother is a two-star admiral. No, they both have interesting assignments. The one that was a ship driver next month is going over to Germany in the Coast Guard. You figure that out because it's a long way to the way to where there's any water. But the, he's part of a task force they formed to work on what they can do on the piracy thing. And uh, the big brother finished up as a tour of the senior military advisor and the Secretary of Homeland Security there in Washington. And his new orders are going down to Key West, which is going to be tough sledding down there. But in any case, how many of it you have ever been in Key West? Okay, there's a section down there that uh, calls the Truman Annex. That's where uh, Truman, like for his uh, winter White House, and uh, it's on a real nice piece of property, and. Uh, since that time, uh, nobody was interested in uh, continuing it for that. So 
older boy there is a two-star admiral, and he's got even a Navy admiral working for him. And he's got 500 people staffed, and their job is to try and do something with all the drugs coming in and all the immigrants that are coming in. And so, uh, good luck on that type thing. But uh, so the Dim, can you still hear me? Okay. Where's the man? I am? Okay. Maybe I'm just running out of gas here. Okay. But uh, after I was in the state militia, I was very disappointed because at the time of the Pearl Harbor, they didn't know whether the locks and the inland canals that are up in Illinois have a critical spot where they, the submarines that they were working on and building up and ships up there would come through the canals that ran through getting down to the Gulf. And it, <laughs> it should be a little higher, maybe. It's, it's not that. It's much likely it goes. <laughs> All right. In any case, um, so they ordered the state militia down to go ahead and guard these locks, and they didn't know what to expect, and it was only a two-week crawl up. And my best friend, he was actually old enough to be in, in there, and he got to go off, and I should have noticed that something was going on when the commanding officer called the oldest man in the unit, they called Pops and me, the kid. And uh, we were told that we were going to be in charge of the armory while everybody was gone. <laughs> so that was a height of excitement there. But what just killed me as a 17-year-old kid was the fellows who went down for that two weeks duty, they all got a rip. <laughs> and as I say, uh, I got 27 ribbons, all for visiting places, though, but none of them involving any bravery or anything. But so I went off to college in '42, and I should have recognized I wasn't going to be there long because everybody was leaving for all the various programs, officer candidate programs, and what have you. And uh, so I had enough money to go for about two years, and then when I realized with the war on, I wasn't going to be, even be there that long. So I decided I would live it up and join the fraternity, and that's not a great place to get an education, but in any case, I learned how to drink beer and smoke a pipe. And I also found out too late that the uh, fraternity was where all the jocks, football team players and everything else. And so what they did, they had this pledge deal. If you're going to join a fraternity and you go through initiation, and they figured the initiation was using the pledges for a scrub team to operate against. I'd never played football in my life. The first time I got tackled by two people at one time that were real football players, I figured I don't need this. And it was interesting because about six months later, Chicago, all the jocks were up there taking their physicals. You're still fooling around, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. And uh, so I don't think you ladies go through this kind of indignities, but uh, there's nothing worse than be standing there real naked and everybody else has muscles and they're standing around looking real healthy, and I was the strongest one there, and I just got over having pneumonia in the hospital, and I passed the physical, and all the, everybody else flunked. <laughs> all the football players had bad knees and everything else, and I could never figure this out because uh, officers' physicals, uh, you're never involved in, if there's any place that's going to be have a tent over or good quarters as an officer, and uh, 
and the men are still laying out in the mud and the rain, but uh, that's the way it was. So I became a cadet midshipman and I got an appointment to Kings Point, the Merchant Marine Academy. Now, there was West Point, there was Annapolis and the Air Force Academy, and King Point was to train Merchant Marine officers. Those were both uh, deck officers and engineering officers. And you also had to be in the Naval Reserve. So as a result, when you graduated, which was way down the road there, you had a double commission. One is a Ensign in the Maritime Service, which you were a licensed um, merchant marine officer, either as a mate or an engineer, or you went on active duty, and you also had a commission as an ensign. So part of the tra training was it was a four-year course, but it was uh, put down and we went through 14 months. And as I explained it to people, we uh, those of you who are college graduates, uh, we dropped the basket weaving and bird study and all these food courses that you may, may remember taking in college. You really didn't need. Uh, you can just stand here and hold it. <laughs> okay, fine. So, part of the training we went through three three months of basic training, and then we went to sea for six months. And I was assigned to a troop transport that ran troops out of Boston and New York over into North Africa, because uh, we were fighting Rommel there with the tanks and all that sort of thing. And so uh, we would be in a 40-ship convoy, if you can imagine, but 40 ships out there would be. And the one thing I could never figure out, the biggest ship and the one that had the heaviest armor and everything else was the battleship Texas that stayed right in the center. So all the ships out here had to be sunk to be able to get to that battleship. But that was higher my pay period making that decision. But uh, it was interesting, we carried 3,000 troops at a time. Now what this was, was a converted passenger liner and on a ship, the lower you can keep the weight down, the more stable it will be. But the first thing they did with this troop transport was go up to the highest decks and put anti-aircraft guns all along both sides. And that was all this thousands of pounds of weight up there. And so the ship was real interesting because it would roll over and rather than snap back, it would just hang there and then finally come back and then roll the other way. So after you got used to that, that was quite a challenge too. But uh, it had a mixture of everything in it. It was part of the Army Transport Service. It had Army people on there, it had Navy people on there, and they had medical uh, people. And uh, so the core troops that they were carrying some of you, I'm sure, went overseas. There were only two meals for you a day because you spend the rest of the time standing in line waiting to finally get fed. How many ever went overseas on a troop transport? Wasn't it fun? <laughs> well, let me tell you what was going on behind some of the scenes there. When the weather got real rough, most people got seasick, and the way they fed you is with buckets of hard-boiled eggs going up and down the passageways of anybody that wanted a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> and someone would take it and throw it at the poor guy, trying to give them away. But uh, it was a matter of, we had some interesting experiences with that because we would stay in this formation and they have a deal how many were in the Navy? Not a very friendly crop, okay. <laughs> but, but in any case, they have a device on the merchant ships and up on the, the Navy ships too that were in a formation. It would be a clock 
and they would send over a code number as to what it would be for that day. You put it on, and that would give you so many minutes, and then ding, and then tell you how many degrees to turn. And it wasn't always the same, so the submarine could see out there and figure it out where to aim the torpedoes, because this was back <laughs> before they made so much progress with uh, torpedoes, because present-day torpedoes just listen with electronics where that engine noise is and goes right after that ship and have pretty good uh, batting average because they mm -hmm. just hit the uh, noise of it. But on this other way, it's like shooting ducks. You know, successful, you give it a little bit of lead and you fire up there and the duck flies into the shell. But, but so as a result of that, here he had all these 40 ships in our category would turn so far, and then on all the ships out there would go ding, and then they would turn all together and then come back, so they never ran into each other, in theory, type thing. Now, one thing I can remember was whoever was lucky enough to be back in this corner, which was called Coffin Corner, on the ship there, because statistically that's where the most ships would got picked off that we're at this far corner now. I never learned in my pay grade what, why that was. But, but in any case, most ex that is a very interesting ship because it had about eight chaplains on there and they would form, uh, they had a closet and they'd get out musical instruments and pass them out to the guys. If you had 3,000 people, you had a lot of people that were in orchestras, and back in civilians, or in high school, or band, or college. And uh, so, as a result, there was always something going on, and the most unhappy people were the nurses, because they put about 30 nurses in one cargo compartment with three bunks high and one shower. and. Uh, I don't know how to tactfully put this, but some of the friendlier nurses fell in love with the ship's officers. <laughs> and they had a whole cabin to themselves and a whole shower to themselves. And uh, my involvement, being a cadet and shipman, which was as low as you could be out of the officers, was to go wake up the officers to go on watch and I never did get over the shock at being at 18 years old and reaching around some of these friendly ladies and to wake up the boyfriend there. It's time to go on watch and they got so they knew my name and they looked up, hi Johnny. <laughs> but uh, any any case, that, that was uh, real interesting. I was impressed with that. But most exciting thing that I ever got involved in, and the only time uh, that I found myself, uh, please God, uh, let me get out of this so and I'll do whatever you want. But in the back of every ship is what they call the steering engine room. And it's a room from about from here over to the wall and from the wall out to where your first row of chairs are. And in there was the equipment that would turn the rudders. Some ships would just have one rudder, but some bigger ships had two rudders on. And there was a great big piece of machinery that hydraulic oil would pump through there and the bridge would steer way up like here and that signal would come all the way back and cause the rudders to turn back and forth. And in there, those oil pumps were run by great big electric motors. And the room was about this tall, and I told you the size of it. And there would always be a man on watch in there. And unfortunately, right out in the middle of the Atlantic there, the fellow was supposed to be on watch on our ship there. 
he wanted to crawl out of there and have a smoke. And he crawled up the ladder and opened the hatch, went and had a smoke. And when you're going back and forth across the North Atlantic, and you're not always t shifting the best course, it's whatever the seas are doing, you have to plow through them, or sometimes you swing back, and as a result, your ships were rolling back and forth. And I never found out what happened to the guy that crawled away, but I know while he was gone, the hatch was open and the waves came over and came down and flooded this room I just described. There were no windows in it or anything. So what there was was North Atlantic cold water up there about your neck level. So as a result, all of a sudden once the water rose up there and shorted out the electric motors, you couldn't steer the ship anymore. And at that point is when the emergency sounds would go up on the horns and the sirens would blow on the destroyers and everything. And everybody would scatter from the ship that I was on and we couldn't steer, we were just stuck over like this and going through a great big circle. So all the ships had to scatter and get out of the way. Now, I can understand now, except I uh, was a little unhappy at the time. I thought everybody would stop until we got fixed. They just all went on, 40 ships, 39 ships, just kept going. And here again, it makes sense. You know, why risk all those people and everything just because of one ship? And so they just kind of wrote us off. And the interesting thing, the, uh, we had a mixture of, of troops and, uh, and also the, the workmen, the boat, and the people who were in the end preparing food. Uh, it just happened to be uh, a minority uh, of people. And so what happened, all the chaplains started re having prayer chains. You'd see these groups out there later on when I would peek out. And they would be praying. And then all these people that had worked in the, the food preparation thing, they put on their best clothes and packed their suitcases. They were all standing alongside the deck. Now, where the hell? thought they were going, you know, because it was just, you wouldn't last over a couple of minutes out there in that cold water. But there they were looking out like somebody was going to come alongside and pick them up. Now, the reason I got a first-hand look at all this was the chief engineer, the chief engineer on the ship is the one that's licensed the highest and the one that's supposed to be the smartest and has all this training and background. And I was in my room, he knocked on the door, he says, kid, I said, yes sir, he says, you'll have a great story to tell your grandchildren if you live through this, but there's only room for two people to work where we're going. And he says, I'm going because I'm the smartest and I know about all this stuff, and you're going because you have a key job. And I couldn't figure out, even though I was an engineering cadet, what the key job was. Well, have you ever seen batteries that they put in lanterns are about this big around and about this high? And they, so they were in the Navy's battle lanterns. So my key job was to stand there in that cold water up to here and hold over my head these battle lanterns while the boss worked on everything. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but when I heard what I was going to do, I put on my best uniforms and shoes and everything else, like I was leaving the ship too for some reason. But I go up there and I realized I'd made the poor decision as I climbed down the ladder. And there I was in North Atlantic wintertime cold water. And that frosted your uh, kneecaps, believe me. And so, for a period of about six hours, we worked in that kind of water. And the 
because you couldn't dry out these electric motors with hair dryers, great big hair dryers, because we would electrocute ourselves standing in the water type thing. So it was an interesting ex experience. And so there's also a thing that works on a ship is a pipe that they can turn on and steam goes through that and sucks along at a little opening and it can empty water out without having electric involved. And so it took us about four hours to get that water down. And of course you warmed up a little bit as the water <laughs> went down and you were just standing in the water. So finally we got it all dried out, steering got going, and at that point the convoy of course was way out of sight. Now we didn't, <laughs> this was a command decision made, I wasn't involved in it. They didn't take any time to still do this, to dodge the submarines. All they did is go as fast as you could go and trying to catch up with the convoy. Now, after one day's time we caught it up because we were going in a straight line and the convoy was going this way and what have you. So that was the end of that story and uh, it was kind of scary. And it also, uh, nobody replaced my uniform and turned green and uh, from having stood in salt water for all those hours. So that, that was the end of that uh, story. Not, another time we got off just one half a day off of Boston on the same ship. And of course, you wonder. We have good, good or bad, bad luck there. Reduction gears are great big things that the steam going through and it causes the turbine to whirl at a real high speed, but they have to take all that high speed and gear it down to where it can be connected into a shaft and make the propeller just go slow around like this. And uh, the key thing on maintenance on that was that the person would go down there and they would pump all the oil out and continually send it through what they call an oil separator, which is a certificate thing around that go at high speed like this and take that oil and any little spots or any impurities in there would go out on the edge of there. And then when you cleaned it, you would take it out and you'd scrape it out, what have you. And guess whose job it was to clean all the oil every day. And uh, so there was a lot of interest by naval intelligence on sabotage and me. And I thought they were building a cross there to <laughs> nail me because I was the, obviously the one that could have dropped in just a handful of nuts and bolts in there and going through these reduction gears that would just destroy them immediately. So, as a result, we came to a screeching halt way off the coast of one, one day out of Boston. And the military, we're, we're nice, did. They send a blimp out to circle us all the time we were just sitting out there. And uh, that made some of us feel a little bit better. But the idea was the blimp, back in those days, the submarines would have to come up and leave a snorkel out that's above the water there so it could get air to run its diesel engines because you could only run so much time on batteries that are charged up in a submarine. And uh, so it, as, a, as a result, if you're way up in a blimp, you can look down and you can see the black mass underneath there. And uh, some of the early days of the, the blimps you could lean out the window and drop a bomb just on the submarine if you were lucky. But in any case, so finally uh, the tugs came out there and pulled us in. And we were in there for five months. And the only way they could replace those reduction gears is, you know, you have all these decks and levels on a ship. And there were about eight decks above the engine room down where this was. 
and they went in the shipyard and they just tugged a great big square, it would be about twice his table across this way and then twice the table out that way until they cut through all these decks and then they would come over with a crane in the shipyard and lower a cable down and pull out the old gears and then lower the new ones in. So I was trying to live on $65 a month and then had all the liberty I wanted. So you can imagine <laughs> everybody about went broke going ashore every night routine and because there's nothing we could do other than wait for the shipyard to finish them off. Now, only one more exciting story that to me was exciting because I thought I was going to get killed is we were going in, we went by Gibraltar. Everybody ran up to look to see if it looks like the Gibraltar emblem on the stationery of the Gibraltar Insurance Company type thing. But in any case, so these 40 ships went into this kind of funnel. You can almost throw a baseball if you're out in the middle of the, the entrance school through into Gibraltar and the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And so as a result of that, we would come out in a start forming lanes of ships and go in. And where they needed the troops was in North Africa. And as a result, they would start hovering over on the south side of the Mediterranean as you go through, which is closest one to Africa. And as we'd done before, we'd just pull up into the docks and the troops would just march off type thing. But at this point, Somebody apparently was aware of it, made the decision we're going to take half those troops, half those ships, and have them go up to Scotland. Now, in Scotland, we had, you know, England was being bombed every night, and Scotland was getting a certain amount of spill off on this. And so, as a result, they took half the convoy and said, sent it up to Scotland. Fortunately, we, I was in the group left, <laughs> and we went up to Scotland, and as we pulled out the next day, we heard on the radio traffic that the Stuka bombers, which is a German bomber made, and they had a design in their leaf so that it would scream as it came down. Of course, the idea was to terrorize the troops or the civilians as he did. Bombers are diving down there. And so they came down, and out of the 40 ship convoy, there were only 20 ships left in there to attack. The rest of us were going up to Scotland, type thing, because we had air superiority <coughs> over there, so we didn't have to worry about bombers. And as a result, there was no way that the ships could move out of the way. and. They made the only decision that made sense, because as the bombers were coming down, it was pretty easy to hit them with bombs, and they were starting to sink, and of course they were loaded with very valuable troops, and we carried tanks and everything else in the storage holes and what have you. And so uh, they made the only decision you could make, they ran all those ships aground, so they got to go as fast as they could and right up over in the sand, and when they sunk, <laughs> there wasn't that far down, and so they were able to save a lot of the men and the equipment that they could load them off of there too. So that was the kind of the end of the fun stories, I think. But the uh, <coughs> getting over to when I. Uh, said, okay, I'll be glad to get up and fake it a while, seeing your speaker's not going to be here. But uh, some of the things that happened were fun. How, how many was around big cities that they ever hear the term tea dances? <coughs> Nobody? 
All right. Well, in all, all the big cities, and I used to come into New York City on leave on the weekends, and Les Brown's orchestra paid at uh, Pennsylvania Hotel. And so it would be about eight ca cadets. We only made $65 a month. We would chip in, and one guy would go rent a room, and all eight of us would sleep all over the place and <laughs> on the floor, and, and the bigger, tougher guys slept on the bed. But in any case, we'd sit there all dressed up in our little officer uniform. Officer uh, shirts, and ties, and cuff links, and everything. We thought we were, you know what. But in any case, they had this little scrawny blonde <coughs> who would get up and sing about four songs, you know, and then she would take a break and she would come over and sit down with us. And oh boy, we thought we were something. Can anybody guess who that girl was? Doris Day. Doris Day. So she's come a long way since then. At the time, we didn't know what we had, but we were impressed. But it, <coughs> as I recall, she didn't have much of a figure back then either. She was pretty scrawny, but in any case, it was her. Okay. Now, I've told this story before, and it's the first time I've had two people raise their hand that knew it was Dorothy. Well, the Les Brown's from the small town I grew up in. Oh, okay. My brother had a picture. Oh, he does. Is he, is he smiling? Yeah, he looked pretty good to me. Oh. Well, in our younger years, everything looked good. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, the latter part of the war, I was on a tanker. And that's what Harris owns oil, carries oil, and carries gasoline. And I convinced my poor old mother that we were carrying water, drinking water. And uh, so she didn't worry so much. I didn't tell you if it's gasoline, you, one torpedo, you, that's all she wrote type thing. But in any case, uh, out of the South Pacific, there was an island called Truck. And we had taken very heavy losses trying to invade these various islands. And so the, the people up the line figured out, why don't we just starve out the Japanese? And so they just left a destroyer that kept circling truck out there and just starved out the Japanese who were there. But uh, one thing you learn, you stay so many miles offshore there because they did have artillery, and you went by there, which was the short point between Venezuela, where you went through the Panama Canal, and then out into the islands, I think. And believe it or not, and I couldn't believe it, was we would pump the oil out of this tanker into big concrete barges. Concrete, if you can imagine this concrete thing, would float out there, and you'd fill it with oil and it'd still be floating. But if you uh, know anything about design on ships, it's the amount of the water you replace versus what the weight is of what's pushing down on it. But in any case, and you'd pull alongside these, and there would be a couple of fellows come out to take your hoses, and they looked like they were in the way in La La Land after being assigned there for months. Please come to the circulation desk. Okay, so any any case, so we would pump the oil out in, into these, and then the ships would come aboard uh, alongside destroyers and take on their fuel. Well, it was one interesting thing aspect there is that we would go in to pick up the mail, and we'd always send an officer in instead of an enlisted man. Uh, not, there's a lot of brave and there's a lot of honest enlisted men, but sometimes when you send them ashore, you wouldn't see them for days and they say, okay, put me on report, I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in any case, here's what I thought was amusing. The people down in the engine room 
always had a big keychain with everything hanging on it. And uh, so the chief petty officers are like sergeants and what have you, and they're the ones that really run everything. And one of them came to me and said, but this is by then I was moved up and where I was in a place where I had a little bit of authority. And uh, they said, sir, can we order six of these little crescent wrenches? Now, you know what a crescent wrench is? Okay, there's a pretty shiny little wrench there, and you can adjust it. And they have the smallest ones about like this, and I've seen one big, as big as that. And so I said, what do you want them for? And he said, well, we only want about six of them. We want to be able to recognize some of the harder workers down here, and they can put it on their keychain. Now, it's crazy that seemed. That was, oh, look what I got on my keychain type thing. So uh, I, I said to the yeoman who ordered all the supplies, order six of those. And taking away six, zero. How the hell that, how the heck that zero got on there <laughs> beyond me? And anyway, so next time we pulled into Pearl Harbor, we put down all the things we needed, spare parts. But we would, as we started coming into Pearl Harbor, coming back from the South Pacific, we'd get the binoculars out and look on the dock. And there's all we would see. Dole pineapple rings, dole crushed pineapple, dole chunks, dole pineapple juice. We couldn't get spare parts, but we could get plenty of pineapple. And of course, that was because they were grown there. But in uh, any case, so for some reason, our uh, little crescent wrench order went through. And so then I thought, hmm, how can I save face now that I'm sitting there with 60 of them? I didn't want to admit that I didn't look very carefully at what I signed. <laughs> you couldn't blame the omen type thing. In any case, so I told the chiefs, I said, here, we've got these, go ahead and pass them out. So I had the engineering department, which was one third of the ship, 100 men. We passed them out. Okay, I'm trying to, how to word this nice for everybody that's sitting here. It was my turn to go in to get the mail. So I took the small boat with a crew in it. We went in to get the mail. I'm going in. And bear in mind, this is out in the week lot in Ulithi. And all the ladies were native ladies out there. And um, there was a shortage of tops, I guess, because uh, they went topless. And, uh, but the interesting thing is I walked up close, and here was a leather thong hanging around their neck and a little crescent wrench. <laughs> I looked some more, and here, going by, little crescent ring. These were hanging around some pretty ugly women, too. <laughs> but, but in any case, I, I came up and I pointed. I pointed, what's that? And in English, I could understand, no get baby. Uh, you got to think, think a little bit here, you know, they, they can get this beautiful uh, lady that uh, she wouldn't get pregnant. But, uh, well, you, you can work it out at home, explain it to each other. Then. Now, as I said, when I said I'll fill in at your last minute replacement, I can just tell you some of the funny things happening that I can remember. Okay. <coughs> Later on, and the longer I, after the wars and everything, oh, I stayed in the reserves, so the Korean War came along, and there were 50 of us 
called up and sent out to San Francisco to Treasure Island to go to atomic defense school out there. We're all engineering types. And so the first weekend, the class lost one member. He had never seen the Atlantic o or the Pacific Ocean, and he must have been from Illinois, like I was. And he swung, swam way out there, and the current got him, and he drowned. So that made one more empty seat in the class room. But it was kind of sad there. The other thing is, after we uh, went through the training out there was mainly how after atomic defense you how voice down the ship and all that sort of thing and uh, so as a result Baron where all of us had been called up the Korean War so they started handing out the orders for ships that all were involved with Korea Everybody got one but me. You know, I kept seeing them hanging out there. And so finally I said, which ship am I going to? Oh, you're not going to there. You're flying over to Africa. And I thought, how the devil did that come about? But it seemed like the fellow that was the engineering officer on the destroyer I was on had been the executive officer of a submarine, the executive officer is the number two man. And he was in charge when he ran her to ground. <laughs> well, that kind of spoils your whole day. And uh, you, they take care of you, they send him to a surface ship, and then to punish him more engineering duty. Would. So I was his relief because he had an attitude problem and wasn't working out. <laughs> Too, too well. But um, anybody ever, ever in the reserves here at all? Okay, congratulations, all right. <laughs> Did you believe everything they told you? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit. Well, in any, any case, I used to get this letter come out of the Navy Department every year when I was in the reserves. They say, what kind of duty would you like if you got called up? And what coast do you want to be out of? And what kind of a ship? And I, I used to just laugh every time as I filled it out the same way. And I always put down destroyer, engineering officer, east coast. So I got ready to graduate out there at Treasure Island put me on a plane, flew me all the way back to Washington, and I had to stay there for three weeks, getting passports and everything else. Why I needed a passport in the Navy is beyond me. But in any case, just to show you a little side sea story there, another officer and I were walking over from the barracks to eat, and a lieutenant commander, we were just uh, uh, lieutenant junior grades. This lieutenant commander was coming down this way, and and we were going this way, and I threw him a salute, you know, and he entered it. And the other guy was with me, he acted like he was looking out there, you know, so he didn't have to salute. And so we went about 10 more paces, and this lieutenant commander said, Lieutenant! And I turned, turned around and, come here, you know, and so I came back and the other guy just kept walking and hadn't saluted and I thought, well, what the devil is going on here? And uh, he said, I admire that you've been trained to salute properly and what have you. And he says, but I want to see you up in my office after you eat. And I thought, oh boy, I hope he didn't like just young lieutenants or something. But in any case, so I got through eating, I came back, and he said, I admire your military training. He says, I've just bought a new Buick. My old Buick is full of gas, 
and here's the keys, and you're going to be here for two weeks, just bring it back full of gas again. So, and I told this guy that didn't salute, he says, oh, no shucks or something. <laughs> but in any case, so I just tooled all over Washington waiting for my paperwork to go through there, and then finally got on a plane and flew, flew over with uh, some empty caskets, a very valuable gun, and got all the way over. And then I got over to, uh, in Iran, and my ship was out at sea, and so I had to wait for it to come in. So to find out things to entertain myself, this was an air base. I would walk down, find out where everybody was going, and then ride along with them type thing. And was that we didn't bother with paperwork. I just would meet them on the edge of the field while they were warming up and hop in. But in any case, the most interesting trip was we flew out of, I can't remember what the name of the base was, up to uh, Casablanca and went to the Buick dealer. And the Buick dealer raised pedigree toy poodles. And the wife had heard about that. And that's where she wanted. So this pilot picked me up. We took off and we went up there. We landed. This guy showed up in a big Buick Roadmaster convertible. We got in, we went out to his house. And here, here was a fellow that, obviously, if you can imagine the Buick dealer over in North Africa, is very successful, apparently, because we come to one of these places that looks like it's in a music set where all the palm trees on both sides and all the natives bow and everything as he goes by and then, uh, convert we're enjoying all this and uh, so then we get up there and he sits down and stirs the strings bring in the father the servant comes in leading the father of the dog that they were considering <laughs> and uh, he would point out the good points the flanks and the fur and all this sort of thing and then after that, then bring out the mother, you know, to bring in the mother. Okay. And then the next one, bring out the offspring. So here are little six little puppies running around there. And so they said, well, just choose one of them. So he couldn't make up his mind. I thought we'd be there all day long because they quit serving drinks. And so we got the one. He said, okay, now you just got to hold that dog while we fly back. And so we flew back here again, landed on the edge of the field, and obviously he couldn't roar up with his government plane and me get out with the dog. So he lets me out, and I have to walk about a half a mile carrying this dog, go along the fence line. And so that was the end of that story. So you can tell I'm getting kind of hard up for stories, right? Okay. Now then. I had some interesting uh, things. Oh, how many people have ever heard of Lily Pons? Was she a dancer or a singer? Or a singer. Well, I, I didn't know that. But I had a, well, it was a small story there. I. We were in the Mediterranean, and I wanted to always take a look and see what uh, Monte Carlo looked like. And I went out there, and I never saw so many uh, expensive cars, and I didn't see any ugly women out there at all. And all these more paunchy, rich guys out there. I was all gussied up in my white uniform and ribbons, and. So I guess I didn't need a uh, tuxedo to get in there. And so I was in there and I was sitting in the coffee shop and having a cup of coffee. And one table over, here was this lady. 
she was having a cup of coffee. And now this was before I was married. Uh, so I said to her, would you care to join me? And she said, no. Gets up and turns her chair around. And the waiter comes over, leads over. That's Lily Pond. So that was a, my success of trying to pick up Lily Pond. <laughs> that, that was a short, short story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might be writing some of this stuff down. <laughs> um, there was. Uh, I always liked to swim. And of course, in, in the Navy, you want to concentrate on not not your style. It's how long you can swim. Because I I never would get excited with say, Oh, we're going to have gym call or a swim call. And the two gunners mates would get out there with high power rifles to kill the sharks. Okay, everybody in, you know. It was kind of hard to be very relaxed there. <laughs> so she didn't see any fins, you know. But uh, every once in a while, the guys with the rifles would just shoot you, shoot one to get you excited about it. But uh, not at a shark, just shoot in the water. Okay. Um, How many voted for uh, McCain? Well, how the hell the other guy get in? Well, uh, any case, uh, McCain had his father was an admiral, and uh, his grandfather was an admiral. And uh, after I got home from the wars. I stayed in the reserves, and so I had to go on active duty for two weeks a year. And so I was out assigned a ship in the Gator Navy. The Gator is an AM that went in, you know, and could land on land and drop the flops down in the bow and what have you. And the Admiral that was in charge of the Norfolk Fleet Gator Navy was uh, Admiral McCain. And so the ship that I was assigned to for two weeks to Duty was really drug, but you had to, to, if you were working towards the retirement, you had to go on active duty for two weeks a year. And uh, so one day I was in the ship store and I uh, I heard a, somebody calling, John, John, Commander Lloyd. And I looked around and what have you. and. During the Korean War, the destroyer I was on, the executive officer was Clifton Cates, Jr. Now, do we have any Marines in the crowd? Okay, but Clifton uh, Cates' father was Commandant of the Marine Corps, I think. And, uh, Cliffy was kind of a square peg in a round hole. Everybody go ashore, you know, and he'd come back because I was the next ranking officer. He says, do you want to go? And we'll have lots of time. fun. I'll take my camera and I can take pictures of flowers. Oh, good boy. I thought we were going to get a tattoo or something, you know. And so as a, as a result of I kept track of him, and uh, I give him this credit for it. He went to Annapolis, but he didn't try and send in his father's footsteps type thing. But he got up to where he was a division commander on destroyer, which meant he had a, about 12 destroyers that he was the boss of. And uh, so he said, well, uh, John, come down and uh, have lunch with me. And he, and he had his own uh, cabin and his own steward and what have you, and it was a very distinctive stove uh, job, and but he wanted to impress me, and uh, of course by that time I was a commander, so so I said okay, and so then the captain of the ship that I'm on, there he says, Admiral McCain is giving a pep talk to the dependents, the wives, you know, the older children, and everything. Sacrifice that your dad's making, you know, going out to sea and what have you. And uh, so 
said, you might enjoy going over and listening to him. So I went over there and I sat in this back of the auditorium and Admiral Kane got up there and gave a very good speech of how he, the Navy and I appreciate the sacrifices that your husbands are going through, you know, having to go out to sea and what have you. And uh, so after it was through talking, and I had sat in the back, so I went out and I was standing on the front porch of the auditorium. Admiral King came out and he said, Well, Commander, what'd you think of my remarks? Well, you know, oh, they were fantastic, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I said, you know, some nice things about it. And he says, Oh, let's sit down here. And so finally the whole pe people cleared out here and the Admiral sitting there and kind of picking my brain what I thought about this and that. Not that I had any great knowledge, it was just he wanted to hear about how the reserves were doing and all this sort of thing. And so he said, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm invited down to lunch down to Captain, uh, what was his name? <laughs> Case, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old, that's why I live at that place. You know? <laughs> But in any case, so uh, so he said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm invited for a lecture down there with Cliff Casey. He said, oh, poor Cliffy. Well, good luck. I hope they have good food. And so he says, uh, would you like a ride down there? And I said, well, that would be very nice, sir. And, and so on an admiral, when he's driving around on the base, there's two flags flying. And uh, so he took his aid, he said, sit up there with the driver, I want to talk to the commander, you know. And so I sat in the back seat, and so we well, drive all over the base, and pull up and we come to this dock, way out there, it's about 100, 200 feet out, and here's Clifton there with his white gloves on and his scrambled eggs hat and everything, and waiting for the admiral who was supposed to come. No waiting for me. He was supposed to come for lunch. I gotta get the story straight. Okay, so that prompt me if we lose the saw here. So as a as a result so Cork the, the officer that that puts up the binoculars and sees this great big Cadillac with Admiral flags flying coming down the dock and of course he gives the word to Cliff and Cliff at that point goes eight, you know, and runs up and brushes his hair and everything, he's standing there grinning, waiting for the Admiral to come. And he about dies because the Admiral pulls up the end of the gangplank and he gets out and comes around and his driver opens the door. I get out, the Admiral puts his arm around me, you know, and says, yeah, it's nice hearing the young man's views, you know, and how it's going. And, and, and poor guy I was going to visit and be impressed by everything. He was just Diana Thompson death, you know. <laughs> Here was the admiral hugging him, or me, you know. <laughs> so I thanked him for the ride and what have you, and he turned around. At that point, he went back to his cabin, you know, to pout. And uh, so the messenger, him, and he says, Captain, uh, Commander Lloyd's here to have lunch with you, sir. And he was just dying a thousand deaths. Where the devil I knew this guy, you know, the admiral. And so uh, then I was really disappointed uh, with all the grandma uh, grandfathers and great grandfathers both <laughs> being able to that one candidate did that. Okay, are we running out of cookies or time? Okay, I'll speed it up. I think I've told all the funny stories. And, uh, oh, tell you a thing, it was a big challenge, is uh, we pulled into the French Riviera, and the ship anchored, and I had the first watch, which meant I had to sit around in the war room drinking coffee, and out on the, on the uh, place where uh, the quarter deck is, and there would be a petty officer and a messenger out there. If there's anything happening, send the messenger in to get me. And 
the uh, commanding officer has got a straight lace, and he wanted no bum boats coming around. Now, I'll correct myself, this was a Montego Bay. And we had been down in Gitmo going through some training, and then on the weekend we went over to Montego. And uh, he says, I don't want any bum boats coming around trying to sell booze to the crew or slip women aboard over the transit and the stern of the ship. And uh, so somebody said, well, what do we do about it? I said, we'll break out the hoses. So I'm sitting in there, and all of a sudden I heard this hoop and holler, and I come get it up, run around out there, and I see this great big dugout crew uh, log boat with a little outboard on it, and a man in a business suit driving it, and a very attractive lady, a mature lady, but older lady. And she didn't have a rent hanging on her neck. <laughs> and so she was standing there, and here was the hose, the crew hosing them down with their life. <laughs> the mayor and his wife. <laughs> and so the uh, poor commanding officer of our ship figured his career was through when they write a nasty gram to the State Department, you know, and, and it goes through all these channels. And so this has a happy ending, though. So, uh, he tells the executive officer, get all dressed up with his medals and everything in his whites and go short, do much bowing and what have you, and invite them out to dinner. So, invite them out to dinner that night. Well, seniority is a big thing in the military, especially in the Navy. In fact, it's so bad as you see another ship coming over the horizon and you're down close aboard. Each captain is trying to identify that other ship and then pull out the book and look who's senior to who. Because you don't exactly bow as you go by, but the junior ship mans the rails, you know, and stands at attention as you close the close board. This is not wartime, but just formalities and peacetime. And so, uh, as a result, the captain sits there and the guest of honor, in this case the mayor, sits there, and the uh, executive officer over there, and then I'm sitting next to the wife. And uh, so we make small talk all the way through the meal. And then as we're having dessert, she leans over to me and she says, I have five very attractive young ladies working all very clean ladies. <laughs> Obviously, she was a man. <laughs> so uh, I didn't pass that on, to, especially to the captain. He didn't. So I've kind of run out of sea stories. Uh, you can tell why I stayed in the reserve, because I got a retirement from it now. I get free pills. <laughs> yeah. Do you still have your wrench? Oh, No, but I started reading things before I signed them. Uh, one really quick story. In Chicago, we had a destroyer escort there at Navy Pier, and. Uh, I, we had a reserve crew on it that would just come aboard and take it out and, and all we do is chug across Lake Michigan and tie up some place where the guys could go in and have a beer, what have you. Sometimes we even had to tie to a tree type thing and run it in the, run in the mud. But in any case, I had a real good yeoman. The yeoman is like a secretary and he also does the reports and what have you. And he was an older gentleman. And he would come up to the bridge, and I would be up there most of the time when we were underway. And 
I found out early on that I didn't have to double check anything he gave me to sign. I would sign and be doing what he was doing. And I said to him, I said, what are you doing in real life? He said, oh, you don't want to know. Well, that intrigued me, you know. And so the next time he came up, another report, you know, I said, I do want to know. And he says, well, he says, I've got a great job here one weekend a, a month. I've only got one boss, and I figured you out what you want, type of thing. And then I put on my little sailor suit and go in and drink a few beers with the other guys and what have you. He was doctor so-and-so, superintendent of schools for the city of Chicago. <laughs> and, and I said to him, gee, with all your education, I can get you a direct commission. He said, no, I want no part of it. He said, I just have to please you, and I go in and have a few beers with the guys, and that's it. Okay, thanks for listening. Anyone have questions? They made me laugh. Everyone have a good evening. And uh, don't forget to donate your way out.